Hello everybody and you are very welcome indeed to our second episode of Savvy Investors at Vectorvest. My name is Susan Hayes Cullerton and I'm delighted to be here with you today to talk to a person who I have met since probably my very first week at Vectorvest back in August 2011. I'm going to tell you in a couple of moments why I asked Steve Chappell to be my interviewee today. I'll tell you all about why, but I'm also going to give you some fun facts about him as well so that you can meet Steve today in a way that you've never met him before. But before I get to that, like I say, let me tell you a little bit about Savvy Investors at Vectorvest. Well, first of all, we created this show because we believe that indeed it is savvy investors and traders who invest with us here at Vectorvest. And we wanted to create a show where we can really and truly help you to be able to live your best life as a trader uh, or as an investor. And along the way, what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce you to a range of different people, both in Vectorvest and outside, so that they can show you their perspective on the markets, on investing, and indeed in the Vectorvest system. But also, I'm going to give you some insights into how I try to be savvy in the stock market as well. Last episode, I focused on how to read an earnings report. And specifically in that show, what I focused on was the Microsoft earnings report. And I was showing you also on the Vectorvest system where you could find out all of the latest earnings releases. For example, Tesla's was out that night. Now, if you have any interest in delving right into an earnings report and reading how to delve into the numbers and the press release and the 10K and the 10Q, etc., make sure to check that episode out. And before I go any further, I'm just going to ask Joey if you wouldn't mind to pop the link for the last episode into the chat. That would be super so that anybody who wants to take a look at that can go right ahead in there and you can like the video so that you can check back in. So the way in which we're going to run today's episode is instead of me taking a specific company and a specific development in it, I am going to have an interview with Steve Chappell. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Steve. First of all, he has been in Vectorvest for as long as I know the company for a start. But Steve was one of the people that trained me at the very beginning. And he, I've seen him particularly in action when he's training. And he trains in a different way than I've ever seen anybody. Steve wants to make sure that every single person in front of him is successful. It doesn't matter how long it takes. It doesn't matter what position they're coming from. It doesn't matter what sort of question they have. I have seen him take a lot of time and a lot of patience or else be really enthralled at how people can learn and grow and be successful. But I've also been at various different shows with Steve as well. And you should see him manage a crowd when he's got a microphone, the vector system behind him, and he's got an audience. He is unbelievable. I've seen him literally hold up a, 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 a laser light, hold it up to a graph, predict what the vector vest views would have said at that time, turn his head, then ask anybody to pick a different point. He predicts the views again and what they say because he simply knows the Vectorvest system inside and out. And for both of those reasons, when it came to choosing today's episode, but particularly when it came to choosing the person that I would interview for today's episode, it was Steve that I chose. However, just before I ask you one question before we get started, there is one other thing that I want to tell you about him, and that is a couple of fun facts, right? So some of you might have met him if you've been at a Vectorvest seminar, or if you've been at a money show, or at various different hot stocks panels, you'd have met him. But let me tell you a couple of fun facts about him. Number one, he proposed to his wife in Dublin on the Haypenny Bridge. That was actually Steve's introduction to me at the time. He said, oh, you're from the place where I proposed to my wife on the Haypenny Bridge in Dublin. Number two, he fosters Great Danes. I didn't know that literally until minutes ago. And number three, he's actually the architect of a lot of wedding experiences. And I'm going to leave that hanging so that when we meet him, he can tell us more about that. But before I introduce you directly to him, what I'm just going to ask you to do, as I do every single episode, is please do let us know where you're tuning in from. So I'm just going to keep an eye over here on my chat. So please do tell us what part of the world that you are tuning in from. I am live here in Dublin. I know that when we bring Steve on, he is going to be joining us live in North Carolina. 
And by the way, what he's doing right this second is probably checking out the market because he's got around about half a second anyway. So he always he always <laughs> seems to use the time productively. So first of all, hello, Christian. You are very welcome. You're joining us from Alter in Belgium. Very happy to have you here. Kenny, you're joining us from Richmond, Virginia, a beautiful part of the world of great friends there. John is joining us from Boston. Ah, John says his best friend is from Galway. John, I went to college in Galway, actually. Lived there four years. Bill is joining us from Rochester in New York. You are very welcome indeed, Bill. And please do keep them coming. Christine is joining us from Brighton in the UK. Hello, Christine. Mary Jane is joining us from British Columbia in Canada. Uh, Bart is joining us from Belgium. Smiley face. (laughs) And in fairness, it is a great country. You deserve a smiley face. We have got Sukraj, who's joining us from Toronto. Karash, who's joining us from Houston. George, who is joining us from Montreal in Canada. Vitality Within You is joining us from Melaque, I think, in Mexico. We have Mamadou, who's joining us from Seattle. Rick, who's joining us from Tege, South Carolina. And family from Donegal, delighted to hear it. Skyliner is joining us from New York City. David is joining us from Naples in Florida. Uh, Tide is joining us from Maryland. Eric is joining us from Texas, exclamation mark. Again, you deserve it. Umar is joining us from Maryland. Oh, okay, that's two people from Maryland that we have today. And, of course, you're only down the road from uh, Richmond in Virginia as well. Chala is joining us from Maine in USA. So please do keep them coming. Keep them coming. We always love to see where people are tuning in from. And yes, of course, tell me your Irish connections. Of course, I want to hear about your Irish connections, whether they're your friend, whether it's a show on TV, whether you've been here, whether you want to be here. Please do as well. I always love to hear that. Any Irish person does. SI is joining us from Costa Rica. Uh, Amarian is joining us and Amarian says hello hoping to get to know stocks more from Texas great to have you here with us okay so what I'm going to do is I am going to shortly bring Steve on screen but I just want to point this out to you is today's episode is how do you really learn about the stock market again I'm grateful to say that since I'm the host of the show I get to choose the themes as well and when it comes to this the reason that I wanted to talk about this is that lots and lots of people like you Amarian Lots of people want to learn about the stock market. There's lots of resources out there. There's lots of free YouTube resources. There's lots of webinars. There's lots of books. There's podcasts. But what I want to ask Steve, because he has put a lot of time in his time with VectorVest into educating people, what I want to know is what really enables people to learn about the stock market. And I'm going to ask him of decades of experience what characteristics that he can discern from investors and traders. I'm going to be talking to him particularly about the mistakes that people make. He sees them. He sees them all the time. I've seen him on his feet, like I told you. I've seen him. I saw Steve particularly present a large proportion of Trade Like a Pro, one of the uh, one of the education seminars that was run in North Carolina that I was at. Steve sees the mistakes people make. He sees the biases. He's seen the trends over the years. So that's what I am going to particularly bring to Steve. But today is a conversation. So make sure and please do ask your questions as well, whether it is a mistake you might keep seeing or you might say, why does it look so easy? Why is it in VectorVest that we particularly talk about certain principles? Please do keep the questions coming in. All of everything that you're saying, I can see over here on my screen because the wonderful Joey is producing this and he will make sure that I see everything anyway. But I can see all of what you want to ask. So please do take the opportunity uh, to do this. I'm also going to welcome Kaluti, who's joining us from uh, Dominic, Maryland. Bob, who's joining us from St. Paul, Minnesota, in the middle of a blizzard. Well, we're glad to keep you company through that blizzard. Certainly, Bob. Okay, so can I ask, please, Steve Chappell, the one and only, uh, I might just bring him, please, here onto my screen. And uh, first of all, Steve, you are very welcome. So what do you think of my introduction? Because you didn't know what I was going to say. It was very thorough. Yes, it was quite thorough. <laughs> I, I thought about this episode a lot before you joined us here, to, here today, Steve. So first of all, for anybody that doesn't know you, will you please tell us a little bit about you and your history at VectorVest, please. Yeah, so maybe the the place to start would be where it all began. And so uh, coming out of college, you know, I I first had a couple of odds and ends jobs where I was a bar back, uh, actually a bar back for my lovely wife that I have now. I eventually worked my way up to bartender at that place and then uh, got sick of doing all that and was really looking for a, a true job, as it were. And so I ended up working for a sports marketing company 
And my account that I was given uh, to manage was the PGA Tour. And so I spent uh, about two and a half years traveling around with those guys doing on-site marketing uh, with PGA Tour credentials. So I was able to see sort of the behind the scenes along with the uh, current action, of course. And I was literally at these courses from about six in the morning to about 6 p.m. Uh, each evening uh, as they were. And that's where I first really and truly got the bug for investing because this was back in 1999. Uh, I started about midway through 98, worked through 99 into 2001. And of course, that was the, the time of the, the tech bubble, if people remember uh, that time in history. I, I remember it vividly because that's where I made some of my hugest mistakes. <laughs> and and in large part, you know, that's why I'm at VectorVest today is because of some of those mistakes I made then. Uh, so one of the things that I picked up on just hearing, uh, you know, the stock market was kind of all the rage, even for some of the players back then who were having great experiences in buying stocks like Yahoo, if anybody has ever heard of that company before and and many others. And so I decided, well, here I am. Uh, I don't have a home because I'm gone four to six weeks out of every two months. <laughs> and and so I'm kind of transplanted. I've got all this money that I'm building up and I'm not doing much with it because I'm just on to the next venue. And so what I decided to do was take a crack at the stock market. And what I decided to do was to pick a lot of the stocks that these guys were talking about. And um, I ended up deciding just, well, just like the the conventional wisdom, which is start with some good stocks, keep investing into them a little bit every month, and over time, you're going to do very well. And so I went about that for about 10 months before I eventually got sick of all of that travel and was looking for another company to work for. And that's where I ran across VectorVest. And believe it or not, the only reason I ran across these guys is they had just moved from Buffalo, New York, down to Charlotte, North Carolina, where I live. And they had put an ad out actually just in the paper. And uh, I had a headhunter and all that kind of stuff at the time. But I figured, well, that's interesting. You know, these guys are talking about stocks. All I've been doing is losing money hand over fist. Uh, let me go check these guys out and see you know, what they have to say. And I, of course, took a trial to the program before I even went to the interview. And I put a bunch of my stocks into the software and I bought Yahoo at north of $200 a share, okay? And back then, uh, these guys were saying that it was worth $46 a share, you know? And so I said, my goodness, uh, that makes a bit of sense to me because my stock is heading towards $46 a share pretty quickly, <laughs> <laughs> you know? And I didn't know anything about market direction or, or anything other than, hey, if the sharpest, brightest, most intelligent uh, financial minds are telling these guys to buy these stocks, then these are the ones I should be buying, you know? And so that's, that, that's kind of my story leading into VectorVest. And what sold me, what sold me early was things like value. And, you know, a lot of the other things that I've learned came along the way, you know, for the last 20 years, but that's kind of where it started is, is getting a grasp on value, what it means and why I had really had no success in the stock market whatsoever. It's it's interesting that you took a trial before going to the interview as a recruitment tool. And um, that's certainly one way of marketing the, co the company's services, uh, for sure, Steve. Well, when you talk about Yahoo, and I mean, you're talking about 98, 99. I mean, a lot of people might yes. talk about, I actually started to invest in 2007. So I didn't know you and I had parallel experiences, actually. Because I learned some of my, as you say, hugest um, <laughs> learnings in the stock market as well in yeah. 2009. And I think that sometimes can be a very good start to an investor's journey because they learn an awful lot about themselves and so on like that. Yeah. But the minute that we talk about that, Steve, somebody then is going to say, well, what if I'm buying into that sort of an environment, particularly given 2022? And I just want to put a question to you here that Chris has sent into us. Chris said, I would start with a mental part of investing and trading before getting started. Fear of missing out, fear of loss, fear of being wrong, and fear of letting a win turn into a loss. So could you maybe just talk to what Chris's point is there is that how do you or the people that you have trained over the years deal with fear? 
Yeah, so I, obviously there's going to be a lot of fear when, when you're brand new. And I think it was Chris, correct? Chris, correct, yeah. Yeah, so Chris is right. I think there's a certain amount of reading uh, that some folks should pursue, and I could make a couple of recommendations there. Uh, there's a couple of great books that I've read now, <laughs> so many that I can't even remember, honestly, but uh, two that come to mind pretty quickly, and they deal specifically with the psychology, which I think is the most difficult part of investing, really, uh, is the psychological battle. And, and those two would be Trading for a Living uh, by Dr. Alexander Elder. I've taught many a money show, been a, you know, shared the same stage at times, and he really is the best, in my view, uh, on that subject. Uh, but there's another one, I believe his name is Mark Douglas, uh, if memory serves correctly. And that book is uh, called Trading in the Zone. And that one deals a lot with mindset and, and approaching trades in the from the correct psychological standpoint as well. So I think those are a couple of pretty good solutions that, that folks could look up. If you Google them, you'll find, I'm sure, uh, very good ratings on those books. And, and they're both really good authors that have many other books that you can eventually move into as well. So uh, I think the, from a psychological standpoint, you want to be trained by people who have been in the battle. And those are two guys that have been in the battle. Mm -hmm. We love a good book recommendation on this show, Steve. So thank you very much indeed for that. And yeah. speaking of reading, they're reading books from the point of view of how to manage broadly speaking. And by the way, one that I would add in is the psychology of money. I think that gives a really good yeah. broad understanding of, of your aspects of, of money in general. And one of the themes that's in that, that we might talk about another time is everything happens in the long tail. And I will leave that point there. Anybody who's read the book will know what I'm talking about. But what do you do to keep up with the markets on a general basis? Because there is, there's lots and lots, like people can have CNBC on all the time. People can be reading news articles all the time. And one of the key changes I think that's happened, and VectorVest has been very much the heart of this, is a, a secular change in investing over the past, let's say 20 years, is access to information. Yeah. So yeah. what do you do to keep up with what's going on in the world of investing? Yeah, so uh, I think that this has also kind of evolved over time. And, and I think in a way, I'm down to kind of the bare necessities at this point. <laughs> I've, I've, learned, I've learned to uh, narrow, narrow my window of information a bit. Uh, I would say I listen a lot to CNBC. I listen to CNBC a lot, both before I come to work and after I get home. So I wake up about 5.30 in the morning. Uh, at six in the morning, I'm already on CNBC. I don't think that is one of their better programming uh, shows that they offer, uh, but um, it does help you keep up to date with what is current in terms of what people are talking about. Uh, I tend to sometimes want to wad up pieces of paper and throw it at the screen, so uh, my wife will uh, ensure that I don't spend too much time <laughs> paying too much attention, but it does keep you abreast of things. Uh, from there, I spend an awful lot of time uh, getting prepped for each day in particular on both the CNBC website along with investing.com. Uh, I've made it a habit to check all of the pertinent economic news that's coming out every day like today. Uh, I could have basically told you that we would likely finish in the red today based on the economic reports that have been received over the last two days. One being uh, the Fed minutes indicating that everyone on the federal board of reserve here in the states that has a voting member wanted to raise interest rates and many probably more people than people would have thought wanted more than a quarter percent hike uh and so you know that a lot of this run up in the stock market from october lows has been on this idea that well looks like they're getting a handle on inflation and so thereby you know they might start to soften their approach and I'm not sure that that's really what's happening. Uh, so along with, you look at PCE came in hot uh, again today. It's one of the mi more minor reports, but still an indication of, in of persistent inflation. And so everything that you're looking at, the jobs market is still strong and, and inflation remains persistent. And I think that that is a recipe for a turbulent time in the stock market until everybody really catches on to the fact that eventually they will uh, stifle this market. Uh, and we will actually, by VectorVest at some stage, likely enter into a bear market scenario. 
which is another interesting topic. And this is what I mean, Susan. I can get off and just oh, I know you start can. talking for <laughs> forever. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, I, it, it, I know you can. Can I just check, Steve, because you mentioned there PCE, and I just want to check that your understanding of that is, is the same as what mine is. PC to me is um, personal consumption expenditure. Is that what PCE is when you were referring to that acronym? Yes. Okay, so that yeah, so that would be a measure of how much people are spending, and of course, very much then a predictive indicator of inflation. Um, we have got a question coming in here from Francisco, who says, uh, "Could you elaborate on the existent confirmed down call? At what point do you get back into the market again?" I am a newbie to investing. Thank you. This is great. Uh, you know, so as I was thinking about today's uh, session and everything, uh, you know. Giving people relatable, useful information right now is really what it's all about. Uh, so I'll just tell you, uh, there's probably somebody in this room right now. I don't know if there is or not. It sure seemed like it yesterday from my trading room uh, that I run here at VectorVest called the Jockey Club. Okay, And we went short just yesterday, uh, mainly because uh, I guess maybe I hadn't been in there for the prior two days. and I, I thought we already should be. But we received the confirmed down call and we had what would be called follow through yesterday. And that is another day legging further down beyond when the signal uh, was delivered by VectorVest. And a confirmed down in VectorVest typically indicates the market is extremely likely to go down for at least another week and possibly a lot further. Okay. And so what we're doing then, we as investors, can only live in the world of what I would call likelihood. You know, there are absolutely no certainties in the stock market. So you have to become receptive to the idea of living under the under the realm or the hood of likelihood. And that is establishing whether markets are likely to go further down or, or not and so on, et cetera. Um, but if you've spent any time in the VectorVest software, uh, you would quickly learn by studying a extended you know, maybe 10 year graph to start, you'd quickly learn that while sometimes markets do quickly reverse off that signal, more often than not, particularly when the economic backdrop is tightening, right? Uh, these down calls actually tend to be more long in the tooth. In other words, they tend to have a lot more durability, right? Than when you're in a raging bull market, like we were all the way up into 2000. Well, really, all the way up to 2022, mm. I guess one could argue. Growth stocks mm. really came off the grid in about February or March of 2021. Uh, but uh, some stocks did continue to roar uh, all the way up to this last year. But all that to say, I, I, I put a lot of credence on that recent confirmed down. I think it was delivered in a really good, timely fashion. And I do think that there is likely, notice I use that word again, likely, more downside to come for a lot of reasons. Um, Can I when just I start think, go ask, ahead. Uh, Steve there, um, I'm sure people are going to ask me, is that, could you just tell us what the Jockey Club is for anybody who's unfamiliar? And secondly, how do they get in there? Yeah, so the Jockey Club is a daily uh, room. It's a trading room where we get together and we leverage the information from the VectorVest platform. Uh, so you, and it's real time. And so you would, eventually want to you know you give you a trial to try out the real-time platform to begin with uh and what we do is we get together every morning at 9 a.m this is east coast usa time new york city time which is a half hour before the market opens and we start getting our uh, mindset right for that current day we start looking at whether we should be bullish or bearish uh if we're bullish what stocks you know, start, are starting to look pretty good uh, to buy that day. If we're bearish, you know, what kind of defensive actions or profit-bearing actions can we take and so on, et cetera. We stay together for about the first hour that the market is open, so till 10.30 a.m. East Coast time. And let me, I might have to check this really quick. I want to give him a link, and maybe Joey's got one, but... Joey has every I'm, link in the universe. <laughs> <laughs> so, Joey, we might just call on you here as well. Um, if I'm guessing that this is a link for, is it the real time trial or is it for the Jockey Club, Steve? It would be for the Jockey Club specifically. Okay. And so I think that that is called Thrive. Hold on one second. 
this is what being live on YouTube is all about. Yeah. <laughs> is that you're and literally you... talking to us here as we are finding these and as we go. Yeah. So, da, 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 da. oh, slash thrive. Let me just double check here. Well, we want to give people the help that they're after, right? Absolutely. I mean, this is what it's all. This is why you brought me on. This is the <laughs> thorough reason that I introduced you in the way that I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Joey, the, the link is www.vectorvest.com slash thrive, T-H-R-I-V-E. I can see he's 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 working on it there, there in the background. Um, yeah, and, and so you can try it out. And this is what I tell folks, okay, the, to try it out for 30 days, it's literally just 30 bucks. Uh, so it's a dollar a day to get potentially the best coaching you've ever received in your lifetime, right? Every single day for an hour and a half, you get you're paying me a dollar <laughs> to check out whether this guy is any good or not. If I can't prove to you that it's worth staying in that room for a week uh, uh, or, or or for the rest of your life, right, in a week's time, or certainly in 30 days time, then then just don't, you know, don't continue. But uh, for a dollar a day, that is uh, unbelievable. <laughs> and, and Steve, can you tell us what patterns or trends have you seen? Not in in trades. I'm I'm going to move up, move away from the trade the trades and, sp and specific interactions there for a moment. But in traders and in, and investors, like what are the common characteristics that you've observed of people yeah. who are really successful as as either traders or investors? Yeah. So uh, it wasn't all that long ago where where I ended up putting a lot of thought around that because. Dr. Delito tasked myself and Jerry D'Ambrosio, who is another top flight instructor here at VectorVest and really my brother from another mother. Uh, I love that guy to death. Sorry for all these funny U.S. expressions. I love Susan. them. I love them. <laughs> it's a whole other ball of wax, as you told me. One <laughs> That's time. right. It's a whole other ball of another. You got to say the word another. Sorry, ball sorry. Of I'm, wax. Still, I'm still learning here. Still learning. <laughs> But, uh, you know, he, he said, we, we, we really need to reach the technical analysis community in a bigger way. And, and we want you guys to develop a course. And so we spent a lot of time looking at professional traders and then discovering, you know, what were some commonalities that those folks had. And, and the truth be told, I see a lot of those same characteristics in some of our very most successful uh, investors and traders that I've known for years. And, and you know, you're going to hear some words that are, are, are you know, are going to seem lofty, right? They're going to seem like it's something that you got to work at. And I think that's important, too. you got to realize that this is a journey that you're on. Uh, it does require some thought and some work, and you get better at it over time, right? But some of those words would be unemotional, mm -hmm. objective, uh, realistic, systematic. I think that's mm -hmm. the most important one. Uh, because when you're systematic, all of these other things fall in line, the better you are at sticking to a system. So my personal belief, and it's not just because I'm the director of trading systems, right? Trading systems development. Uh, I really feel the more systematic people become, the more, and Dr. Delito, who started this company more than 25 years ago at this point, uh, probably closer to 35 years, if I if I had to guess, we were just a three ring binder that we mailed out in the in the mail to folks back then. It wasn't even electronic, you know. Uh, he's always believed, though, to some degree, that you know people need the right useful information, and then they need to build a systematic approach around that. So you got to know when when to buy, what to buy, and when to sell them, right? And so the more systematic you can become, the more successful you will become. And, and I believe that to be a hard truth, not a, uh, this might be true. I, I believe that to be a hard truth. Mm. But systematic, Steve, doesn't necessarily mean that my system and your system need to be the same, does it? It certainly doesn't. I, I think, and that's another part of the journey. So we're get, maybe going to hear that word journey a lot. I, I think part of the journey is discovering who you really are, because Sometimes who you really are and who you think you are are two different things. And so what I mean by that is you might see a system that produces 40%, realistically, 40% annualized rates of return that are truly achievable. But the reality is your investment temperament, your actual makeup won't allow for that because in order to achieve those kind of results, you have to be willing to assume a good a bit more 
uh, amount of risk, you know, in order to get there. In other words, your drawdowns in your portfolios, you know, uh, you got to be looser with your stop losses and, and all of these things uh, sound, boy, well, who cares? Because I'm going to make 40%. Well, that's one, that's, that's one way to think about it. But if you got a million dollar account, okay, are you willing to watch $250,000 of that go away at any one time? Because that's really just about the only way to get there. Uh, and so you got to discover who you are and maybe you're better off with the 10 to 15% a year because has anybody, have you heard of the rule of 72, Susan? Absolutely, I have. My degree is financial maths and economics and it's an actuarial rule. So can I tell well, everyone this is, what this is, right? Because you brought it up. <laughs> all right. The rule of 72 is that when you divide 72 by an interest rate, it tells you how long it takes to double your money. So for example, if you divide yes. 72 by nine, the answer is eight. So at 9%, compound and um, rate of return, then it will take you eight years to double your money. It was a rule That's that we great. learned in our first first year of actuarial studies. Yep. It's very rudimentary. It is. But it's it, very handy. But it's, it's also very informative because we as investors should not worry as much about the next three months as we should about the next three years or 10 years. Right. And so, uh, You'd be surprised where you get on a lot of people will on just 15% a year. You mean 15% drawdown? Uh, returns. Return. Well, okay. Now they know. <laughs> yes. So, well, 72 divided by 15, I'm going to say is doubling your money within five years ish. Yes. yes. Four and change, I think. Yeah. yeah. Four and change. So uh, just people here have been commenting and please do keep the comments coming in and keep the questions coming in. John, you're very welcome. You're just joining us from Toronto and Canada. And that one of the questions here is that I'm a newbie to investing. So top three tips, Steve, to people who are new, entirely new to the world of investing, what would they be? Yeah. So I think the first thing is we've already talked about, you got to realize it's a journey, but with that comes then the idea that you want to diversify in how you go about your business. And you want to think of that in terms of not just the quantities of stocks, but the uh, the stocks, the caliber of the stocks that you're doing, you want to stay diversified by industry as best you can. And you want to start small mm -hmm. and add to your winners, not your losers. <laughs> okay. And that's, uh, that's, again, it sounds incredibly easy, uh, but those are the things I think that move the needle the most for the newer folks. Don't do what I did. Put all of your money into a particular stock or three. You know, I think when you start, you want to think in terms of 10 stocks or more. And then as you get more comfortable down the line, I think you can start moving to five because there are advantages to that and they are substantial. Uh, the less you less you become, say, your own personal mutual fund. I got a funny story about this if you want me to tell it. Sure, go uh, ahead. The better, the better you're gonna do. But We've all got stories from events season, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so well, I was in Phoenix, Arizona. This was probably, I was fairly new. This was probably 15 years ago or so. So I had been here about five, maybe six years. And I was approached by a gentleman, uh, a very discerning looking gentleman uh, who made it clear to me that he wanted to pull me off to the side so that nobody else uh, would know what the discussion was about. And I said, oh boy, you know, here we go. But he pulls out this spreadsheet, you know, and he's got all this information, what looks like a bunch of stocks in their data. And he says, I need help. You know, where do I start? Uh, I inherited uh, all these stocks, uh, you know, and, you know, I, I have no idea where to begin. And I said, well, how many stocks are there? You, you want to get, you want to take a guess? I'm because of, the way in which you're telling the story, I'm going to say 42. 99. Ooh. So the first thing I said is, well, you got to buy one more. That way you get to an even hundred. <laughs> <laughs> and the second thing and, you said was. <laughs> and then I said, what you want to do is you want to take all these stocks. You want to put them into a watch list in VectorVest. And what you want to do is it does not have to, because, you know, this can be a very challenging endeavor. So you don't have to fix things overnight. Uh, what you want to do is get them in a watch list and you want to peel a few stocks off the bottom every week and roll that money into the stocks that remain. 
and and you just want to keep going about that until you finally get down to at most say 20 stocks uh, otherwise you know you you'd be just as good buying a little bit of the s p every month mm. because you are you know, essentially anything more than 20 stocks you're getting towards that kind of performance with your portfolios um so that that was that was the general guidance but i i couldn't believe it i i people <laughs> i'd never seen anybody come close uh to 99 stocks 99 mm. stocks is a lot <laughs> well i would but the most i've ever heard actually is 72 that number's wow. coming up again. I've I've heard of someone telling me that they had well, seventy two stocks. Yeah, they probably t they probably took the rule of, t of seventy two uh, <laughs> and applied it to something else <laughs> the wrong way. <laughs> By the way, when Steve talks about putting them into a watch list and then well, you have a technique at Vectorvest called weeding the garden. You can check mm -hmm. it out. Lots and lots and lots of us talk about that on webinars and on this YouTube channel, etc. So I won't elaborate on that, Steve. But I will just say that that is not. That is not just a, a whimsical statement. That's something that we do we do talk an awful lot about. Steve, if I can, yep. I'm going to come back to those words you mentioned there about emotional, sorry, unemotional, objective, systematic, etc. Now, and also you said that you and I can have different systems and you and I would probably be two different types of characters. I'd say you're more, far more a trader than I am. You're far more in, able to tolerate shorting stocks than I am. I'm a more buying put sort of woman. And also, of course, I'm based in Europe and therefore the investing environment that I'd have grown up in is different to yours geographically and otherwise. Yeah, you got challenges. Yeah, more challenges, hurdles. But, yeah. And just by the way, another fun fact, the, the, this, the picture frame that you can see behind Steve's head, it's actually the word there is challenge. It's one of the most challenging golf course holes in the world. It's from Pebble Beach in California. So he doesn't say that word lightly. But anyway, <laughs> back, to, back to my point. How do you handle your own emotions going into a downturn because you seem to be well able to handle them and you also handle them systematically and also Steve this isn't just you looking at your own screen taking your own trades like you run the jockey club so everyone's looking at you all those people spending those $30 a month trying to determine whether to spend the rest of their lives with you or not they're all watching what do you do yeah so it's interesting you bring it up that way uh, because that's kind of where I would have ended up. Uh, I have zero challenges with my own personality and controlling my emotions for my own trading. Uh, I would not say that that was the case many years ago before I discovered that being systematic does work. Um, where I have any challenges at all and I do lose sleep at night uh, is in this trading room that we're we keep talking about we always have new folks coming in every single day for the very first time mm. and i don't care how good of a trader or how good of an investor you are uh, you are going to make a significant number of mistakes uh and so you know my guy even just recently if i think about this week i could see where some folks who would have said, well, boy, you know, this guy, what, you know, where's the market at now? But this guy went short. I know he got the signal and everything, but he went short. And all the market has done since he went short is go up. So I'm just going to close all these things out because he has no idea what he's talking about. Right. And they never come back to the jockey club because that one day of experience, they've already made their mind up on you know, the quality of the education that we're receiving. So that keeps me up at night. And I say that because I get some of those emails. The The flip side of that equation is uh, those folks who are resilient, who are objective, and, you know, who do embody a lot of the characteristics that we talked about earlier are the folks who send me the other emails. And those are by far uh, outweigh, in terms of numbers, uh, the counter. And so, um, I don't lose as much sleep anymore, but you know, initially it used to just really, I am Susan, uh, as I like to call myself, the imperfect perfectionist. Okay, I think you'll so, have to explain what that means. The imperfect Yeah, that means that, that means, that means I have, uh, a, 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 uh, a, 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 I have diagnosed myself as, as, as being my own problem <laughs> because I over, I, I over, um, I, I overanalyze and worry about my impact uh, on others, if only for the last 10 minutes, you know, versus the, the impact I know I can have on them, given the amount of time necessary to make them successful. I worry about the 10 minutes where things didn't go quite so well. 
probably way too much. Mm. But do you know, that's <laughs> you know? Steve, the, the hallmark of a true trader is because often in that period of time, a lot happens. And like I say, I, I remember watching you train people at Trade Like a Pro when that was very much the way in which you had to make decisions. Or, and of course, any time that you don't do something is a decision in itself. Uh, I just yes. want to just want to share some some of what's coming in through here in the chat. So first of all, you're very welcome, Chris, who's joining us from Ontario, Canada. Uh, Francisco says, I have another question. Will you do well when you use the confirmation call up and down when you invest in TQQQ? And Tommy Doyle says, been in the jockey club for two years. Love it. Rarely miss a session. OK, great. Uh, that's good. Thank you for the kind words. And, and, and on the subject of the TQQQ, I do trade. So let's first maybe discuss quickly what TQQ is. So that is known as a contra ETF or an inverse ETF. So an ETF is an exchange traded fund. It's a com composite of stocks, right? An inverse ETF, instead of being long those stocks, the money managers are short those securities. And they do that in a number of ways through derivatives and other things to keep leverage in in intact. So they come in variety. They come in one to one, two to one, or three to one. And that means if you buy the TQQQ and the NASDAQ goes down, for every point that the NASDAQ goes down, you receive three points of credit into your account, okay, by way of price appreciation, not credit. <laughs> but it has three times the reward when you're right. Of course, the downfall for some folks is it has threefold the consequences when you're wrong. <laughs> mm -hmm. And for that reason, it makes them incredibly challenging to trade, even for the people who have been trading successfully for a long time, like myself. I, I find them the most incredibly difficult things to manage, even for myself. So I'm going to put that out there right away. I, I like folks when they're new to begin with the, the single, the, just yeah. the one-to-one -one correlation. Right, yes. Uh, now, in terms of in terms of uh, the, the T triple Q or the SRTY, which is the Russell, you know, in terms of all that leverage. And another one, sorry, Steve, that's coming in here. Chris is mentioning is the SQQQ as well. Yeah. So the SQQQ is 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 uh, well, that's the short. The T might be long. Uh, yeah, if I remember that's, correctly, that's, that's what he's mentioning, but levered nonetheless. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, one, the, the S is short, but as we were mentioning, the T is long. Um, but, you know, the, the, the main thing is, yes, I think the confirmed down call does help even more establish the continuation uh, of a move. You're probably going to want to enter and exit uh, those kinds of leveraged positions before those calls are made <laughs> mm. uh, in both directions because a significant amount of that leverage gets readjusted as the transitions in the market come into play. So the best way that I've ever found, and I've looked at them a lot of different ways, is to do things in combinations with them. I'd largely just follow a three period and an eight period exponential moving average, okay? And, so uh, and three period and eight period, doesn't matter if it's day, week, minute? In this case, we're talking weeks, I'm mean, sorry, days, but that is a set of moving averages that I have truly kind of landed on the position of it works in any time frame. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's faster than say a 50 and a 200 by a good margin. Um, and, and so uh, talking days, lots yeah. of people look at a 50 and a 200 day moving average, a three and an eight week, for example, uh, is is going to cut that time frame down significantly, but still keep you in very very long term trends. Um, so just look at any charts with them on any time frame you like. I like them on minute charts all the way <laughs> to weeks. I really do, um, and I use them largely to guide me. However, you know I use that in combination a lot of times with a stochastics and also candle pattern uh, to better time when I'm going to pull, initiate or pull that position off. So whoever put the question in is on the more sophisticated side of trading. I don't want to go too far down that avenue unless we really do. Uh, so I'm trying to keep things quite general. But 
the person that asked that question knows what I'm talking about. It's <laughs> it like you're having a experience. private conversation with them. So yes, Francisco, yeah. I'm guessing that, and if you want to pick up on that, of course, you can always engage with us through through various other means as well. Yeah. Um, Kirk right. Beck just said, I tried to sign up for the Jockey Club based on the web address and it said the offer is no longer available. Please give me a current address. So I um, am... Ah. Send me a, so just send me an email to uh, Steve C at vectorvest.com and I will get you, uh, I'll get you hooked up. Okay. And uh, I'm just going to pull Steve back up here on my own screen because he has just, looks like that he has left, but he hasn't, don't worry. I tried to, I tried to click that link. Yep. Oh. There you go. Perfect. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very, very much indeed, um, Joy. So if we could look at the mistakes people make because you say you have to be willing to make mistakes and i'm always intrigued steve you and i met about this recently when it comes to trading systems in europe is that a lot of the time when you look at a successful run and when i say a successful run of trades i'm going to say in my case again let's say the investor that i am let's say the european investor that i am i invest in the us as well i particularly like options and a whole load of characteristics about me that a lot of people who watch my shows have learned but one of the things that i will say about me as an investor is that i like to make relatively few trades and i like good liquidity i don't like to pay a lot for bid ask spreads i like to sell um i like to sell cash secured puts in order to gain my positions all those sorts of things all told We all like to be able to approach or beat the market. And the challenge that can come with that then is that, as you mentioned, sometimes we do make mistakes. But I'm always intrigued that if I'm right 50% of the time, but I'm right significantly more in those specific trades than I'm wrong, then I can have a very, very significant outperformance. So sometimes I think, you know, the the sense that you have to be right all the time, number one, it's, it's first of all, you don't need to be. And it's no. um, holding yourself to that to that type of, of standard is just going to set you up for emotional distress. All that yes. said, Steve, there are avoidable mistakes. What are they? Yeah, so I'll just build up a little bit more around maybe where you just were in terms of success rate. So I find that I'm more in line with about 60 to 65 percent kind of vacillate in that region with my long term core holdings. Okay. And you get the benefit of time. Lots yes. of it. Mm. Mm. <laughs> uh, and I find that I am less than 50% successful on my short-term trading opportunities. But the way that the trades are designed are 1% or, or one point of risk to at least two points of reward potentially from the charts. Uh, can so, you, Can you tell us what? how do you measure risk and reward? Lots of ways of doing it. What, what do you there are tons, that? tons and tons of ways. I, I take a very rudimentary approach. Uh, I have learned so much, Susan, over the last 20 years. I don't think any investor or trader should ever have to go through that because then eventually, you know, you start trying all these different things and you, you kind of come full circle to where you really should have been the whole time, right? Uh, and, and that is the simple things is what works. I, I'm sure people have heard the expression. It's probably uh, nobody's not heard it, but uh, kiss, keep things simple, somebody. Um, we'll use good terminology here. <laughs> keep this family friendly. Mm. Uh, but, you know, it's, I use support and resistance, essentially. So I'm I'm using swing highs and swing lows. Uh, and uh, what I like to do is build up positions around prior swing lows. So I can use that as a level of support. I generally set then my stop loss a reasonable amount below the ultimate uh, swing low. Uh, that's come into play recently. And then I'll set my target, usually a dollar or so, depending on the uh, price value of the stock, but generally about a dollar or so inside um, prior swing high, which what we call resistance. Um, I do trade breakouts on occasion. And in that case, people see me do that in the jockey club a lot. And then I'll, you know, I'll hold um, that same methodology below the breakout level. Uh, so my 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 initial risk is actually usually quite small in comparison to the potential reward because if you're a breakout and you've got no resistance in sight, you know profits are then virtually deemed unlimited. Um, so the one thing that I do do, and I think everybody should do, is keep your initial uh, risk quite low. I never carry more than one and a half percent risk on any trade that I ever do. Period. And you you can do that very easily, 
or you can buy books like by Van Tharp and uh, good, lots of luck. Okay. I'm making it through that thing. Um, so I do it in terms of numbers. Uh, Dr. Delito taught me Pareto's law many, many years ago. I use that in business. I use it in investing. I use it at home. I use it all the time. If that is, I want to get 80% of the result with 20% of the effort, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you know? And, and so my 20% of the effort is I just like to try to build up to a portfolio of 10 trades. I, I generally, if I'm just going to use a flat stop loss, then can afford 15% off the purchase price. And you're risking no more than one and a half percent in any trade you ever do. Assuming that you've got equal sized positions. Uh, so you can go through the whole position sizing thing if you like. Uh, I really don't don't think that's necessary, and and in some respects, I wish it was never taught. <laughs> oh, interesting, <laughs> because, interesting. Because it, it just makes things too difficult. Yeah. You know, uh, there's no reason that anybody should ever really have to do it, and and I know what the natural reaction to that would be by some folks who have taken the time to do it and now practice it. And good for you. There is absolutely nothing wrong with that. That is doing a hundred percent of the work for a hundred percent of the returns. Mm -hmm. No problem. What I'm talking about is not having to do 100% of the work. In fact, only having to do well less than 20% of the work. In fact, almost no work at all and and should receive about the same reward. That's that's a good risk reward ratio in in a different in a different way. Yes. And we have we've another question that has come in here. I mean, you know, we've it's, it's interesting that we haven't got to this topic in depth a bit more earlier, actually. So Francisco says, we're in a turbulent market because the Federal Reserve trying to combat inflation. By the way, being on the European continent right now, I would also say that there's a couple of other things contributing towards that. But certainly <laughs> that's one. Um, yes. So Francisco says, what are your projections for the slowdown of the indexes? Bearing in mind, obviously, the year the 2022 delivered. Yeah, so I would address that in a couple of ways. First and foremost, I don't like to break predictions because then I'm literally no different than anybody else out there. And what I find is most predictions fail. And a lot of times the predictions fail not because of how smart the person is that makes the prediction. It's a new piece of data that comes along that was not foreseen, <laughs> you know, True. that changes the course of things. Yeah. Uh, so and that information these days can come around in the next 15 minutes, you know, sometimes. But I would say this, what we try to do at VectorVest is, and I have learned to do myself, is to just stay objective, right? And what we do know right now is that, let me make sure this is true. <laughs> I only wanna give factual information. We are in a down down, okay? So what that means in VectorVest is the short-term trend of the market is down, the long-term trend of the market is down. So the only way to play the stock market right now is down. And we will continue to do that until at least it goes to an up down where the short term trend of the market has turned back up enough for us to generate that signal. And that sometimes can be many weeks and sometimes could be just a couple of days from now. As I look at the current state of uh, affairs in VectorVest, though, it seems like we're firmly in a down down right now. Um, you know, so well. I should say the primary wave down. Mm -hmm. um, the underlying trend down is kind of right on the right in that area where we're moving into that underlying down. So uh, I think that that's going to become more pronounced. I think the markets, I think as you had, so if you want personal opinion and realize that this is, this is just, uh, this is the part where you're no different than anybody else. <laughs> Except uniquely so, yeah. <laughs> Maybe a little bit uniquely so. I think the Fed's going to have to update their dot plot next meeting. And the reason I would say that is, and that's where they're going in the future, okay? We've been talking about, I'm talking about the U.S. Fed here, of course. Um, we're, we're talking a target range of, what was it, 5.1 to 5.5? Is that right, Susan? Check me out. It changes so often, Steve. I don't I don't want to be specifically definitive because I've, I've read various different things on that. So let's go okay. with that for now. All right, we'll go with that for now because that's largely where, I know that's where we began, essentially. It was a slight adjustment at one point. Uh, so we're going to be essentially at five, you know, as we as we as we get into after this next announcement, most likely, you know, and so you're in that range. So they're going to have to make an adjustment. So a lot of folks are thinking that this next round here in March is going to be very interesting. And if you start to see fairly sizable adjustments there um, and you likely will, you know, based on 
all the information that we're receiving right now, uh, I don't see anything, you know, indicating they're not going to raise next quarter. And by the tone of everything and the actual data that's coming in that we've seen so far, I think you're in for probably more adjustments than have already been forecast. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, and that's, you know, if you read the little green book by Dr. Delito, this is not new. Have you ever seen a soft landing, Susan? Well, now again, let me paraphrase here. I I grew up in a country that had that was predicted of the soft landing after the Celtic Tiger, which led us right into the phone book of the IMF in 2010. So, okay. have I seen a soft landing of property in Ireland? Uh, no. Have I seen a soft landing of financial of a financial crisis? No. I think this this year currently, Steve, Ireland is the fastest growing nation in the European Union at a time yeah. when a recession was predicted broadly speaking. So yep. perhaps we're looking at that now and I think that's cushioned to use that term by jobs which you mentioned there earlier as well. So that's yeah. a nuanced answer. Yeah. yeah, I could see I could see folks even building up a case here in the states to that on that line of thinking to a certain degree. And I don't know how many folks here are vector vest people, but I did a presentation I'm assuming all but you know, you ever know. Uh I did a presentation a couple of weeks back, maybe three now, called Climbing the Wall of Worry. I saw that. Yes. And one of the things that I pointed out, which was interesting to me, is that, you know, at VectorVest, we look at the forward earnings, okay? So we look at the, our projection is on the forward. And what we do is we look at a trailing up to 12 year. We look at where the consensus analyst estimates are for not only this year, but the year following. And then we extrapolate all that data into a one-year lead, okay? Now, in our climate graph, what we do is we boil that down to a 50-period 50, 50 average so we can look at the slope uh, of that information. And what I've been noticing here recently is that earnings held up quite well so far in this first uh, quarter, and that slope has stopped falling and is now jotting slightly up over the course of the last five weeks in aggregate. And so... There's there's one truth to the stock market that will be true to the end of time, and that is if earnings are rising, the stocks go up. Money goes <laughs> where know? money grows, as you said to me one time. Yes, money goes where money grows. And so it's not as if there is no fundamental reason not to be still thinking about being long equities right now, which is why I don't think we're in a landslide downward move right now. I think you're actually going to see some volatility until things become more clear. And what will make things more clear is where the Fed is going, because the enemy of earnings is interest in inflation. So if, if, if inflation stays persistent and interest continues to rise, though, that's like burning the candle at both ends. OK, you're getting to the middle faster. Yes. <laughs> and that is yes. yeah, and yeah. that is earnings are eventually going to succumb to those enemies. And they always have, and they always will. And uh, I'm I'm happy to hear you say that you have not seen a soft landing because, as far as I can recall, I'm always wondering. I'm open to the idea that I'm <laughs> making a mistake when I say this, but I've never seen one. So I compare that to the Sasquatch. You know, everybody thinks they've seen one, but he doesn't really exist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So many ways that I could when I say uh, that Sasquatch, I could, could corral in, in, in with one. Um, I, what I'm going to do, Steve, is I'm going to wrap up today with a couple of comments. So Chris yeah. says, wow, I day trade the TQQQ and SQQQ with three and eight EMA. Again, there for anyone who's unfamiliar, that's uh, the exponential moving average. And he says it works fairly well. Uh, and yes. then also Anne asks here, and what's the best advice in this market in a European country where every trade costs you 0.3%? next to transaction costs. Now, and I will say, of course, that does depend on where you are. And certainly Steve and I talked to our colleague, Tam Van Nooyen in Belgium, who talks about the, the short term trading costs and percentage. And of course, in that case, the number of transactions that you make really matter. The di and I don't know where you're based, obviously. The difference between that and where I am is that in Belgium, there isn't capital gains tax, whereas where I am in Ireland, there is capital gains tax and it's 33% above yeah. uh, tax free allowance. And the last comment, Steve, would you believe, comes in from another one and only, Ardy Cullerton, uh, namely my husband, who has just, just put in a message here saying, very good interview, Steve. I wish you all the best. 
Steve Arden uh, and I. I love, I love him dearly. I hope he can hear me say that. He's, I'd say he's, he can. Uh, yeah, the three of us at dinner one night, our after money show in Florida. A memory to yeah. be savored. A memory to be savored indeed. So on yes. that note, Steve, thanks so much indeed for being here. You absolutely lived up to the reason of why I picked, picked you for this episode from the very beginning. And thank you. I hope so. Uh, it never feels like you do, you know, but I hope so. And I hope, I hope everybody has a prosperous year. And uh, here's the best news of all, guys. There's always room to be optimistic. And I'm going to tell you one of the best reasons why. And that is no matter where we ultimately go here, there is going to be an incredible buying opportunity. And uh, stay tuned to VectorVest because we're going to tell you when. Okay. There you go. There you go, indeed. Steve, thanks so much, very much indeed. And Joey, I'm going to head on over uh, to my full cam here. Thank you. And, and so there you go. There you have it. As I mentioned to you at the very beginning, I've worked with Steve now for, for a long time, but particularly seeing the way in which he trains people and the way he inspires people to really be the best versions of traders and investors that they are. You've now seen why. He's got immense experience. He has enormous enthusiasm and he knows the VectorVest system inside and out. So to each and every single one of you, thank you so much indeed for being here. Really appreciate all of your comments as well. Thank you for letting me know where you've been tuning in from. Of course, if you're watching this and you want to comment on it, please do uh, t t check in there on the comments. We're often take a look there and I'll respond to them. Please do like this episode if you enjoyed today's content because it just makes it more available then for other people to be able to find out whether they're getting started or of course, as they're looking to adapt and understand more and more about their trading uh, personalities. I also want to give a shout out to FIN711. I know it's a group of university students who are going to be tuning in. Just want to say a particular hello to you as well, because I know that this is also part of your own, as Steve says, your own journey. Savvy Investors Effectivist is going to be back with you again next month. And of course, I will also see you for the ESG. So again, for me, Susan Hayes-Cullerton, thank you so much indeed for being here. I'll see you next month. Bye.